Before we get started, hello and welcome to the show's newest patron, Lorna. I'm so excited to have you here and thank you for signing up to the Patreon to pledge to the show. Every penny helps to keep this platform alive and without the support of patrons, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Lorna, and I hope that you enjoy the exclusive content. If you would like to support the show or receive these mini-series in full-length episodes with early access and no ads, or to get access to exclusive monthly deep dives into various cults, the occasional memoirs, and discounts on merchandise, you can find me at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault or click the link in the episode description. And now, on to the show. Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's mini-series. I'm your speaker Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, and for this instalment I'm going to be talking with Lisa about her experiences growing up in The Work, a group led by a man known as Brother Julius. In this series, Lisa discusses how a man convinced many that he was a prophet, God here on earth, and dubbed himself the sinful messiah. Throughout Brother Julius's reign of terror, He would break up marriages, create a real estate empire worth millions, and force himself onto the females and young women of the movement that he had created. Brother Julius died in 1996, and in his wake, Paul and Joanne Sweetman took over leadership of the work. Perhaps the most shocking turn of events was when a human leg bone was unearthed on a golf course, belonging to none other than missing leader Paul Sweetman. This mini-series will be in four parts, with part one bringing you information on Lisa's early life and integration into the work at a young age. Part two will explore growing up in the work and how things changed over time. In part three, Lisa speaks about the various abuses, scandals and information that has been exposed in recent years regarding Brother Julius and the work, finishing with part four, where Lisa talks us through her escape and recovery from this extremely difficult experience. I truly connected with Lisa during our conversation and I feel very honoured to have heard her story. It takes true courage to speak out, and for that, Lisa's voice is invaluable. Here to tell us about her life in the work is Lisa. So hello, Lisa, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me here today to talk about a group that we have not discussed yet on the show and something that I honestly really don't know much about. So this is going to be a huge education for me today and hopefully for the listeners as well. I appreciate your willingness to talk about this difficult subject after our discussion about how much all of this still impacts you and your life. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Uh, Hi, Casey, and thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast. Uh, My name is Lisa, and I live in New York, and I'm very vocal and and public about my experiences being raised in this cult and everything that happened after I left. Is New York somewhere that you've moved to recently or a place you've moved back to, or is it a big part of your your whole life no I was born and raised in Boston um but when my mother joined the cult we did move to Connecticut I shouldn't say well I was born in Boston I wasn't really I was raised more in Connecticut And then I moved to New York in 1996. So from what you said there, we can go on to assume that this isn't a group you were born into, but one that you and your family joined when you were a child. Yes, I was five. And what is the name of the group that we're going to be discussing today? It was referred to as The Work, which was sort of short for The Work of God, but it was just referred to as The Work. And if you were to give us um, a brief summary or overview of this movement, sort of like a five line wiki kind of thing, what, what, what would that look like? It would look like there was a man who led a group of people and he came to declare himself God returned and that his mission and his message in, in returning was to end the world, to bring about the end of the world uh, because of sin against God. So he made him, he started as a teacher and a prophet and as he got more, you know, converts and realized how many people were willing to do anything he asked, he sort of, you know, went large and and said, uh, I'm God. And, you know, how much will you do for me? You know, that's when it started getting scary when I started realizing 
you know, that, that people, you know, really thought he was God. And that was what I was raised to believe. Sorry, it's more than wiki there, but yeah, his message was he was going to end the world and that we were his special chosen angels to help him bring this about that we weren't just normal humans. What's the name of, of this individual? Brother Julius. He went by Julius Shack now. But we had to call him the Lord. It's interesting that he has decided to make himself the person that will bring in the end times because usually with apocalyptic cults, it's that there's a doomsday prophecy and that the group will be saved. So it's it's really kind of like a, a unique caveat, I suppose, that Brother Julius has been told or identified or come up with or, or, or whatever people choose to believe about Brother Julius. Well, that was the fear tactic that was used was that, you know, we were to be instrumental in bringing about the end of the world if we sort of stayed in his army. But if we, you know, deviated or left this, quote, fellowship, um, we would be among those uh, destroyed by God's wrath and vengeance. And, you know, the entire cult, if I had to say it in one sentence, was just very fear-based, you know, ruled by terror and fear. And, uh, you know, God was an angry God and um, a lot of fire and brimstone. It was not a gentle message. Uh, it was all, you know, based out of revelations, although he used the scriptures, but twisted them for his own agenda. So Brother Julius bases his teachings on the Christian Bible? For the most part, yes. But there's also a book called the Urantia. And as I found out later, he was even mixing in elements of science fiction. Um, he, he kind of made a real amalgam of belief systems that became palatable for some reason, which of course, as a child, I didn't understand. But then as I became adult in the cult, um, it's not that it made sense to me. It's just that it was my whole world. It was all I knew. And you, you were just taught to not question. It wasn't even a, 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 like a possibility to question. You did as you were told. And you, you know, you, you were a, a chosen follower, a disciple. And, it, it, you know, it, it didn't get that extreme. It wasn't that extreme in the beginning. He did just seem like a Bible teacher. He called himself a prophet. There's a book by a journalist called Joseph L. Flatley that's called New Age Grifter, Gabriel of Urantia. And that's really interesting because I'm not sure that they're based on the same person. But he talks about, well, the, the cult leader talks about having a cosmic family. So does that sound like something that is familiar to the teachings that you were a part of? No, I'm not familiar with that. I just know that there were occasions and he would talk about things like, you know, there's other worlds and planets that haven't been discovered, you know, things of that nature. Not that we were going to go into space or anything, but, you know, he would just expand any knowledge that a human would have and, and put this spin on it that, like, you don't really know anything and I know everything. And uh, we were just receptive little sponges and very scared all the time. And, well, I can only speak for myself. There were some that were very chuff about it because they were the upper echelon and sort of more chosen than us baggage keepers you know he was very into putting us into categories to keep us in line and to humiliate and to get us to sort of climb up the ranks what period in history did brother julius start this movement and at what point did you in 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 the group's timeline did you and your family join well my mother met him in 1971 when i was 5 and it was because she had a friend I mean, I don't know how much background you want on her or not, but, you know, she is always what I would refer to as a seeker, like a spiritual seeker, very sort of discontent and wanted more from her life than being a wife and mother. So she met Brother Julius, her and her friend went and, you know, she said, oh, there's this prophet teaching out of the Bible on a hill and he was wearing a robe, you know, like a burlap robe. And he had a good amount of people around him, young people, you know, what we would refer to as, as hippies back then, you know, with the beards and just very hungry for this alternate truth, this alternate knowledge, because everybody was rebelling against the system and business and money in the world. And so, you know, this man comes along and, and wants to give everyone a special job in this army of God. And um, so it was around 1971. And very soon after she met him, she decided to uproot us as a family, myself, my father, my brother, 
And we moved to Wallingford, Connecticut, and we didn't even have a place to live yet. My father didn't even have a job so, so that she could follow him in Connecticut. I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. How far is Boston to Connecticut in a, in a car, for example? Uh, about three hours. So it's not too much of a geographical distance, but of course, for you as a child, it's uprooting your whole life, your, your friends, your school and everything you're familiar with. Yes. It's like, you know, one day I'm a child with a dog in a little suburban ranch on a street, you know, going to kindergarten. And the next thing you know, there's arguments between my father and mother, which I didn't understand what any of it was about, but that we were going to be moving. Soon thereafter, my mother decided to, you know, just bring us into it, although my father never joined. And that was always a huge bone of contention and a real stick in the spokes of the wheel of their, their marriage. And it's very, very sad actually, because he died when I was 13, and he was only 38. And, you know, the atmosphere of life around that event was definitely very steeped in the cult and my mother's beliefs and what was forced upon me to believe because organically I have no idea, I have no template of normalcy. So what I believed was just, you know, when you're a child, you trust adults, you trust your parents. They could tell you the sky is polka dotted every day. And even if you're looking at it, well, I guess everyone else sees that it's blue, but it's not, you know, my mother and father wouldn't lie to me, but I was always very cognizant of the fact that as I grew up, you know, there were fights between them and including like a separation and then a, a reuniting because my father never bought into it, but he didn't want to leave her because he didn't want to lose us kids. And he might have thought it was just a phase she was going through. As far as you're aware, was there ever a discussion of the children staying with the father whilst the mother goes to to kind of see what Brother Julius is all about? I don't think so. I, I don't think back then that that was really an option. I, You know, uh, my father was a very gentle, sort of passive man, and I don't think he stood up to my mother very much. She decided this was going to happen and that she would take the children and he didn't want to, he, he really never wanted to leave Boston, the, um, that area at all, because that's where all of our family are from, um, including my mother's family too. She, she left a large family to go do this. And it was very radical. It was, again, I was five, so I was just along for the ride. But when I look back on it, I do realize how radical it was to just follow this man because he was based out of actually married in Connecticut um, I'm not quite sure how he wound up in Massachusetts, but he was gathering followers, but he also had followers in Connecticut. And I think people came in from New Jersey and things like that. So your father really had two choices. It was either follow your mother and stay a part of, you know, your life or stay behind in Boston and lose the, the marriage and his children. Yes, I'm not sure um, if he would have fought to, to, you know, for custody of us or anything. It's all sort of irrelevant right now, but um, I just don't think that was ever an issue that he wouldn't come with us. You know, maybe he thought he could talk her out of it. I don't really know. Just that it was always very, very tense. And that we all, even I missed, even at that young age, like I had cousins and a lot of aunts and uncles. And I knew on some level that I wouldn't see them very often, if at all, because my mother is a very strong-willed person. So maybe in the same way where your father was maybe hoping that he could you know, w wait things out or convince your mother to return home, she's probably thinking in the same way that she can eventually encourage your father to join the group. So they're both, <laughs> both trying to fight their own battle. <laughs> Absolutely. So how many siblings do you have at this point? I have a brother who is a little less than a year older than me. We're what they call Irish twins. Uh, we're like a year apart. And um, we, we don't have a relationship, actually. We were never really close anyway, but he is my only sibling. Right. So the four of you move from, from Boston over to Connecticut. You have absolutely no idea where you're going to live or how you're going to get money. We moved, I remember vividly, moving into uh, what's called a motor inn. It was called the Yale Motor Inn in Wallingford. 
I, I even remember it was on Route 5. And I remember the pool and I remember how run down it was and that we just stayed there. I don't really recall how long. You know, some details are a little bit muddy, um, but we stayed there until we could find a rental to live in and until my father found a job, which he did. He found a job as a typesetter for a newspaper in New Haven, Connecticut. And then we moved to a little house, a little apartment in uh, Wallingford. And then the deluge, the barrage of meetings, meetings, meetings happened. And I tried to have a childhood. I mean, I did go to school and I wasn't brought into the Bible meetings for a while, but I do have, you know, again, pretty vivid recollections of what that was like. That's, that's the way my memoir begins, actually. I'm really excited to learn more about your memoir as well and um, what we can expect from that. It's my understanding that you're 14 pages in at the moment. Yes. Which isn't a lot, I realize. Maybe maybe according to word count, it actually would seem like more. But I'm trying to flesh it out. I'm trying to really, you know, not hold back on the details. It's very important to be raw and to really make the reader not just know um, events, you know, intellectually, but to try to get to the feelings of what, what I went through as a child and just how surreal it is to live in, in this sort of alternate reality. at this point where you are at the motel and when you described it I don't know if you've watched Ozark on Netflix but that's kind of what I was picturing there's like a motel there with a with a small pool and that's kind of what it was just dingy the word that comes to mind is is just dingy and my brother and I would like to swim in the pool because that's what kids like to do but I I just do recall that it was dirty and and very just depressing because again I went from a suburban I mean, we weren't in Boston proper. We were in a little suburb, like outside of it. Um, I just say Boston because that is where I was born. But the town was called Hanover, if that's relevant. Um, But it was like a nice little town. And I remember the woods at the end of the street. I remember riding my bicycle to the candy store. I remember exactly where my school was. I think I was in kindergarten, possibly first grade. Yes, it was first grade because in Wallingford, I started school in the second grade. And at this stage it's not an intentional community there isn't a group of people all living together but there is an established place where all of these bible meetings take place yeah it was never the cult was never a commune everyone had their separate homes um but there were two or three different places where meetings would be held and my mother would always go and i and i remember the tension at home because we would sort of test the emotional temperature of things when she would get home and you know her mood being based on what the meeting was like if it was you know intense or heavy those are buzzwords or more uplifting and and oh we're doing good and we're so yeah those were held in rented halls the bible meetings and they were always led by brother julius uh yes and it's also important to note that in Meriden, which is the next town next to Wallingford, he had uh, a music and publishing company called Tampco, where most people worked. Right. OK, this is kind of feeling a lot like the the Source family, which I covered last month in terms of the decade and the music and yeah. how everybody worked at the Source restaurant. There were a lot of cult, cult owned companies, actually, that we all worked at. All owned by the same person uh yes owned by julius and his sort of hench person who was a businessman you know it started with tamco and then there was a construction company a real estate company aluminum siding solar panels there was uh, hot dog restaurants I, I worked in a lot of them i i wasn't allowed we weren't allowed to have jobs quote in the world you know it was us versus the world the world was evil and bad and we were good And, you know, like it says in the Bible, be separate, all that stuff. So if 
Julius is using the money that followers are bringing to him to purchase properties. He's then creating businesses that his followers will be employed at to create more of an insular environment, but also means that he isn't needing to outsource anything like carpentry or an electrician or a plumber because he's creating all of these businesses that take care of all of that. Every business was completely internal. I mean, except for rare exception, people from the outside weren't coming in to work for the companies. I think the initial money, perhaps for the real estate agency and the construction company came from investments from this businessman named Paul Sweetman. And, um, you know, to be honest, I don't know a lot of sort of the business or financial background. I just know that that was the cornerstone of how people got jobs and how eventually it became a multi-million dollar, um, you know, corporation because people were selling real estate. Everything was huge in the 80s, building boom. And everyone just, you know, slaved away, either a real estate agent, a construction laborer, or I worked usually as like a receptionist or a cold caller, but I remember a lot of years working in a hot dog restaurant. I suppose in that same way, then, if people are getting jobs in one of the companies that's been established by Brother Julius, people also wouldn't need to go outside of the community for things like buying a new house and needing somebody that works in real estate. You would just find somebody within the group that could offer you that service for the most part so when your mum is attending these bible meetings how how often when you're kind of first in connecticut how often are these meetings taking place and is your father able to get a job and and what does that whole part of your life look like my father worked third shift at um, a newspaper uh, as a typesetter and my mother was a housewife who I mean she I mean she would go to a lot of bible meetings but she was also working at Tampco which is the name of the the anointed music and publishing company uh, and she worked as a proofreader and I think she was an artist I think she did some illustrations and these were we're talking about gigantic books it was like a set of like big encyclopedia books called Walk With Me, Walk With Jesus. It was a retelling of the Bible through the eyes of Julius. And there was also music. There was a band, um, the anointed band. A couple of my uncles played <laughs> instruments in it. And actually, they were quite good. <laughs> the name of the album is God is Alive. And I think for a while, it was actually commercially successful. Did Julius use his music business to generate his propaganda? I think it became very attractive to young people, you know, seekers of knowledge and wisdom and people rebelling against their families or conventional religion. And, you know, what's more attractive than, oh, well, we're just working publishing books and we're learning truth about Jesus and God. And because, again, at this time, he's not calling himself Christ returned. He's, he's a messenger. He's a prophet. He's in, enlightened. You know, he has a calling and he's trying to tell us that we have callings. Um, but yeah, people were interested in the music and just the fellowship of it. The idea that, you know, we were all the same and the world was bad and suddenly everything made sense in this group, which of course, in hindsight, it was insane, but things make sense when you're in a cult. You don't know you're in one till you're out. That, that's the irony. So your father manages to get a job at the local newspaper. Yes. Is he the person that is in the home in the mornings before you go to school and once you return home from school? He worked third shift and he slept during the day. And, you know, we, me and my brother were under pretty strict orders to not wake him up. <laughs> Don't poke the bear. <laughs> um, so I do remember a lot of time just alone. I mean, you know, I was going to school and my mom was doing the the required things. I mean, you know, it was like normal on the on the surface, cooking and cleaning. And, you know, she would have a lot of friends from the cult over, you know, sort of de facto aunts and uncles for me. Um, these were all just people that were in my life as a regular thing. But there was no outside life, which as a child, I came to realize later was abnormal to not have a life outside of this group. And 
well, why is having friends over bad? And why, you know, children should not see other children as being evil or threatening. It shouldn't even be in our mindset to think about good and evil, really. And I do remember when I would sometimes sneak people in, <laughs> um, being very embarrassed because my mother had so many photos and pictures of Julius around the house. And people would say, well, who's that? Oh, well, that's... Uh, you know, our, our preacher, our teacher. I played outside a lot. Trust me. I, I played outside in the yard with my little stuffed animals, my little plastic figurines. And I was a very dreamy, sort of imaginative kid. Very, I read books like crazy and I just would always try to escape. I would escape something I didn't really know I was escaping, just that I always felt very scared, very sad, very estranged from normalcy. Um, you know, just didn't really have much of a relationship with my mother. I'm, I'm sad to say, I'm regretful to say, you know, she's still alive and everything, you know, but that ship has sailed. I mean, that, that severance, that severing has occurred and we are estranged. We, you know, we speak maybe once a year, once every six months as like a very mild catch up, but it's not like a mother daughter conversation um, because things have turned back around into conversations about this group which she still believes she met the Christ and she still believes her mindset's the same. And I refuse to broach that topic anymore, except in this way, I'm not going to capitulate to these crazy beliefs because I was abused and, and I saw abuse and, you know, it, it has a ripple effect and it stays, you know, I, I live a pretty normal life right now, but it really stays it. You know, they say it changes your, uh, your hippocampus and your, Amyg amygdala, amygdala, when you're a child, when you get barraged with these strange messages. And I mean, it gets weirder, trust me, as we go on with this, you'll realize it as we were systematically stripped of our identity, what that felt like. But as an adult, you're able to set firm boundaries around the type of communication that you're willing to have in order to protect yourself. I'm getting much better at it. When I know she's calling me, I usually let her go to voicemail and then I decide if I'm going to text back or call back. Sometimes I do, often I don't because I don't see the point in it. She's never met my grandchildren and she won't. And she never had a relationship with my children and they have no desire for that. They're adults now. And not to sound cruel, but that ship has sailed. You know, she was not there as a mother or grandmother in those years at all. Her, her allegiance and her devotion was to brother Julius, period, end of. <laughs> And not to my father, it, 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 there was no emotional loyalty to him. I, I just don't recall seeing any affection. And and he wanted to, he tried so hard to stick it out. And, you know, I'll never forget when she kicked him out of the house and and I would walk home from school and, and visit him in like the, the boarding house, like a man's, like a single man's boarding house and just how sad I felt and how he felt and, he was in this sad little room with like a nightstand with a, a Bible on it. And he would say, tell your mom, I want to come home or tell your mom I'm reading the Bible. You know, he was a very sweet, gentle man who, who I miss every day. I'm, I'm much more like him. I think I, in temperament and, you know, I have very good memories of him. I remember, you know, the music he would play so loud that it would be blaring out the windows when I'd walk home from school he was a very generous person. He was very funny. He was always laughing. He had a lot of friends at work. He lived a very separate life within the structure of the marriage from my mother. I, I just remember that chasm, that separation, um, not realizing again till later that that's not really normal. Oh, I'm sorry that you lost your father at such a young age. He sounded like a really great man who had a positive influence on your life when everything else was a bit of a struggle yeah he was when he died it was like the last shred of normalcy that kind of uh, I feel like it cut the string of this kite that just kind of flew off into the this strange world that I became more and more involved in against my will you know even the circumstances around his death were very steeped in let's just say I wasn't allowed to grieve normally there was no period of normal grieving. The, the, the attitude was like, well, he was, he was not a believer. He hardened his heart against God. That's why he had, had a heart attack. 
And so God punished him. And I remember one time hearing he's in hell where he belongs. Oh. And I was 13. So that's one of the pivotal moments of my life that I, you know, process, process a lot. You know, I miss him. So, you know, I was pretty close to him as, as a 13 year old. He was, he did more things with my brother, you know, little league and bowling and things like that, paper routes. And, um, but he was very sweet with me and we had some good talks and he was just always very gentle. My mother was the yeller and my dad was always trying to pacify her. You know, I just remember his, his low sort of deep voice always just saying like, calm down, settle down, quiet down. You know, you're going to scare the kids and, or sometimes we'd be at the dinner table and my mother would be in another room and we would hear her like shaking in the spirit as they call it. And like the, the ceiling would vibrate. And I remember my father looking up and saying to me, well, your, your mom's just doing her thing. <laughs> Carry on, <laughs> keep eating. Yeah, like he was always trying to smooth the waters, which were so turbulent all the time. You know, I didn't understand why inside of me, I was always nervous. You know, we were taught to fear this man, you know, that, that something bad was going to happen if you didn't fall into, into line. So after the passing of your father, you're really funneled into the activities that your mother has been taking part in for the last sort of eight or so years at that point. I don't recall the exact age I was when I started being allowed to go to meetings. It was a very big deal when you were an adolescent to be allowed into the meetings and you were given, it's hard to explain, you were given what was known as a word or a quality of God. You weren't allowed to use your regular name anymore. And, and it was, but it was like a happy thing. It was like an exciting thing. <laughs> This happened, I think I was around 12. So it was before my father died. And I remember coming home from a meeting one time and, and saying to him very excitedly, I got a word, I got a word. And realizing that his face fell and he didn't care. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> we weren't allowed to use our, our names because he was starting to really amp up the stripping of our individuality and, you know, autonomous thought so it was brother julius that would assign new names to each follower or disciple or congregant or i don't know what name he would have given you sheep <laughs> we, we were called followers yeah followers so brother julius would assign a new name to each follower when they became of age or or in his eyes eligible to be included in in the you know the inner workings of things he would assign new names to, you know, the adults uh, um, and the children. And then, of course, any new babies born into the group were definitely named by him, including my daughter. But I'm ahead of myself. We, we wore robes to meetings. You know, we had to make our own robes. We, you know, we got to a point we weren't even wearing street clothes. We had these placards around our neck that looked like a star of David with a heart in it and then a cross in the middle of that. And, you know, we were all sort of proud of being individual in this way and, and standing out. And it was like a good thing to be different. And, oh, you know, it's gonna be a good thing when you're all persecuted for my sake and, you know, be different and, and stand out from the crowd. And, and he wanted people to question us. He wanted us to bring in new followers by opening up these conversations with people about why we have a bumper sticker on our car that says God exists, he's a man and you better stop sinning and um, changing your license plate on your car to include like your, your quality. And by that, I mean like mine was abundance and then he changed it. Well, he added to it to use the word affection. And then he did something strange with the grammar of that. And it was like abundant affection abundantly affectionate affectioning <laughs> affectioning this that's what it was and he had he had a good time with the words everybody had to get used to suddenly not calling someone you know bill or tom or rob it was like oh wait your your name is diligence your name is um vigilance your name is thanksgiving you know anything sort of positive uh and sometimes he would even take it to where then there'd be like a hebrew derivation of it 
you know, everything he did, he had a way of backing, believe it or not, by some kind of scripture or some kind of philosophy, theology of, 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 of Judaism mixed with Christianity. It was a, it was a strange amalgam. And the robes that you would all make, I've, I've got a picture here of the sort of the heart shaped shields and, um, and swords that people would wield with the, um, the star of David with the cross in the middle. So I kind of, I, I guess if you were to look from the outside in, you'd be able to identify what, what sorts of aspects were in the belief system, at least because the two biggest pieces of iconography from those two major religions are evidently right there on the chest. I think with any idea of wearing a uniform is to promote obviously uniformity and, and, and no more individualism. And it, it puts you in a mindset of you're part of a group, you're part of, um, you know, and I don't know what the blue band on the bottom signified. I just, I do remember learn, trying to learn to sew and make my own white robe with a blue border. And then how excited I was to get my own, you know, wooden, whatever you want to call it, a plaque, a necklace, a pendant. And, and again, being too young to even know what it really meant, but just knowing that it was important to be a part of this and to please my mother and to just, you know, go along. You're just kind of swept along this strange river. Does your education continue as normal as possible for you during these years after your father passes away or, or does it really suffer in, in place of attending more of these Bible meetings and increasing your presence within the work? Education was something that was tolerated as far as, you know, like we weren't regular humans. <laughs> I mean, that was the thought process within the, the cult. But of course the kids, you know, legally we have to go to school the main priority was going to the meetings, but I did go to school. Uh, my father died when I was in the seventh grade, but I remember going to middle school and junior high school and high school, um, but being, but feeling lonely, isolated, different, weird, not having friends hardly at all. And knowing that I wasn't being encouraged to pursue an education or a job, or you know how you ask a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? you know, my answer would be, well, uh, you know, to bring about the end of the world, <laughs> not I want to be a teacher or a doctor or a veterinarian. In my case, I wanted to be a writer. I knew that from a very young age. And um, I did make it up to, you know, the 11th grade and the 12th grade. And I wanted to graduate and go to college, but I was forbidden to. And basically I was kind of forced to drop out of high school, which is one of the biggest regrets of my life. One of the biggest things I'm sad about because I really wanted to go to college. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to do something to do with words and writing. And, you know, Julius, I remember meeting with him at this big, long wooden table and him banging his hand down like on the table at me, you know, you'll write for God. He would bellow, you know, you're not going to go to college. I know what college girls do. And then he used a slew of profanities and you know, I was, quote, pure at that time. There was there was nothing going on. I mean, we weren't encouraged to date. You know, you had to date within the work and you had to marry within the work and Julius had to approve everything you did. You know, my marriage was pretty much arranged. And my child, my first child is a product of that. That is the end of part one of this mini series. If you would like to get weekly episodes in full length, early access and ad free, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. In part two, Lisa explores her life growing up in the work, with part three looking at various abuses and scandals within the movement, and part four exploring Lisa's escape and recovery from the work. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey host of the Cult Vault podcast.